Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, where there are a lot of happy people. Spurs have just beaten Newcastle by four goals to one. And um, Gary, you've been impressed by what you've seen, have you not? Yeah, I've been impressed with them all season. Obviously, we did the game last weekend, didn't we, at the uh, Etihad, and they were very good there. I mean, they could have been turned over in the first half. Erling Haaland missed those couple of chances. But what you cannot deny is the football. And it sounds really simple this but football fans love watching exciting football and they'll forgive a lot if you actually are watching football that's breathtaking and it is such a brilliant way of playing I used to love I mentioned this a few weeks ago or a month or so ago Pochettino's time here because his football was high high energy front foot pressing the technical level that we're watching out there in this Spurs team is fantastic. And they're not the best players in the world, by the way. In fact, they've lost their one world-class player, or their, their world, one of their world-class players, because Son is another one. Um, and at the start of the season, if you just said to me that Ange Postecoglou was get, would get a team playing like this, I would have said, no, no chance. You know, even if he's a great coach, to come and get them doing what they're doing. But I love doing the games. Every time you sort of get your rotor at the end of sort of one month and you get your forward rotor for the next, if I see Tottenham there, I think, yeah, I'm having that because I know it's going to be a really good game. And that's what we all want. And today they were fantastic and they've been beaten up in the last few weeks. And I start asked a question in the first half last week, at what point does this great football turn into sort of naivety? And I think it's right we asked that when you've not won for a month. But they have had injuries and it is exciting. And as a Tottenham fan, they're with the players, they're with the manager. They want this. This is what they want. And you know, they won't finish, I don't think, in the top three. But they could get that fourth place. What they've got to imagine is, and they're sat there now a couple of points, two or three points off four. They've got to imagine that at some point in the season, I think that Arsenal, Liverpool and City now will finish in the top three. What those others behind them, including obviously Tottenham here, have got to imagine is that Villa maybe do have that rough patch and that they start to have a few injuries and things start to go wrong for them and that they can wait for them and they can be there to pounce. So, look, get Van der Ven back, get Madison back. Um, but even without them to be playing like this, and Newcastle are a good side who've built up a lot of trust in the last 12 months of how they played. We've all enjoyed them. They're a really good side. But they've been pumped here today. They really have. Um, I know that we'll talk about Newcastle and the tiredness aspect of it, but they've not been able to live with the football that Spurs have played. It was the worst team for Newcastle to probably play today because they're just breathtaking and the speed of play, the tempo of the play, the way in which they run forward and sort of um, commit. Every time they break, it's like the fullbacks are running forward, the midfield players are running forward. And it does remind me a little bit of sort of going back to sort of the best teams. They don't care what's behind them, they just go, they go. And it's a brilliant, brilliant spectacle. Don't you feel a little sorry for Newcastle, though? Because that is the very football... You, you do. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I really do. Because I think there's an honest team there and a very, very good team, so many of whose best players are missing. And instinctively under Eddie Howe, am I not right in saying that, that they want to be playing that Tottenham football? Yeah, look, I'm feeling sorry for them. I expected this at the start of the season, to be fair. And I don't get every prediction right, but I thought it would be a struggle for them to, co to cope with Champions League. I think I had them outside the top six in the first Monday night football season. I think I had them seventh. I just thought it would be a struggle, the Wednesday-Saturday slog. And I think the fa we're finding that. We're seeing it out there. They looked absolutely dead in that first half in, in particular. But what you have to do, I think, when you are struggling physically, and it's easier said, you have to be better on the ball then. You have to find a way, a different way. And obviously physically, if you don't feel physically right as a football player or any walk of life, it really does take away the other aspects of the game as well that you need you just feel drained, your legs don't move as quickly as they should do, you know where you want to be but you're not quite there, I mean Michael Dawson mentioned at half time about the Kieran Trippier one where he heads it, if your feet are sharp, you know, you go back in with the run of Kulisevsky but then you shift back and then you get that head up and you, you, know, you just you, you, your feet movement, your anticipation, everything's just that little bit quicker when you're feeling perfect and you know, really sort of at your full strength sort of physical uh, capacity so for me today, I have a little bit of sympathy, not unexpected in the sort of grand scheme of things, because I thought that they would struggle as a club to handle Champions League, to handle Premier League football and maintain that same level and do what they did last season. So maybe we're seeing what we thought we would see. Still really good from Newcastle, because like you say, they, 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 have, some in, they have some injuries that obviously are, are costing them. But for me, they've got oh, AC Milan, is it on... Tuesday or Wednesday? Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. yeah. 
big game for them. And sometimes you can find something in your legs for these types of matches and nights. So don't think that what we've seen today in terms of tiredness is going to sort of reappear on Wednesday. I play games on a weekend sometimes where you're just not quite there. Then you sometimes get to a Wednesday night big match and you can just feel, for some reason, the adrenaline just goes and you're away. And we could see that. Hopefully we will see that on Wednesday night from Newcastle. Yeah, good luck to them in that, uh, that Champions League tie. You mentioned Aston Villa. They're the flavour of the month or flavour of the week, aren't they? They're yeah. flying. So is this a purple patch or Aston Villa really good? No, they're, they're really good. I had them fifth at the start of the season. I thought Unai Emery would do something really good with them. I've got so much respect for him as a coach. I learnt a lot about him when I was over in Valencia for that four months, about how he operated, what, what, what he, how he was thought of over there. Um, and he's got such an outstanding CV. Obviously, people remember, obviously, the time it was a difficult for him at Arsenal, but he's a brilliant coach. And what they're doing, I don't think, is just a, a moment. Um, it will be difficult to sustain it in the long term because of the lack of spending compared to the other clubs. But I think what we're seeing at this moment in time is here to stay. I had them fifth at the start of the season. I think that's where they could finish. I think they may just drop out towards the end. But we saw with Newcastle last year, you know, and he's got the experience to deal with it, um, Unai Emery. He won't be scared. He won't be sort of worried about the fact that, you know, upsetting the apple cart and disrupting the top clubs. Uh, and Manchester United and Chelsea are awful at this moment in timing. You know, they spent a fortune. So there's a chance there for him. That fourth space is up for grabs. Just for people who want to get carried away, Villa fans in particular. And why wouldn't they right now? They've just been Arsenal and City. Yeah. Um, just a bit of fun. I've given you no warning of this question, but before the game in the press room, I was talking to a couple of the others, and the question was raised, compare Aston, uh, Aston Villa right now with Leicester December 2015 in the middle of their extraordinary season. Conte and Mares and yeah. Vardy. Um, are Villa as good as Leicester were then? Oh, no, the, and the, if so, why not? No, Villa are as good as Leicester back then. The thing was that I think that was a poor season in Premier League terms in terms of the other top clubs. Pep's first season wasn't it? and I think that City weren't, no, weren't anywhere near the level. Arsenal were nowhere near the level. So for me, I think they're definitely the equal or better than Leicester were back in 2015, but that won't translate into the same achievement. What Leicester did was spectacular and sort of should never be forgotten. One of the great Premier League moments, if not the greatest. But Villa this season have got some serious operators around them. I'm not sure that season that Leicester had the same level. Well, they didn't have the same level of competition. So don't be critical to either team, um, either Leicester or Villa. Both exceptional in terms of sort of what they're doing at this moment in time. For Villa to be where they are is exceptional with the just generally sort of where they were in the last few years. So for me, you know, well done to Aston Villa, but they won't win the league. And I'd be surprised if they finished in the top four, but I'd love them to. OK, we're a week away from uh, the game that you most look forward to, almost dread, which is Liverpool against Manchester United, which is a way in a way of framing this week's Manchester United question off the back of what happened against Bournemouth yesterday. Liverpool have won. Um, how are you feeling? Seven days short of the big one for both of those clubs. Yeah, I've not thought about it too much until you sort of promoted it in the game and I sort of went, uh, uh. Um, Yeah, I don't know. It's, look, I just, I, at the moment, I think we're just sort of, if you like, biding our time, aren't we, till the new ownership starts. And, you know, I said before, people say, oh, you can't blame the Glazers for this, you can't blame the Glazers for that. You can absolutely put the success or lack of it in a sporting sense, down to the owners. They haven't got a sporting director. They haven't got someone to say no to a manager that's strong enough to say no to a manager when they get a little bit of success like Eric Ten Hag did last year or when the other managers over the last four or five times have done it where they've got a little bit of power, then they take over recruitment and they start signing players and then they start sort of getting bigger than they should do. You know, every other club has a really, really sort of competent sporting department and it's down to the Glazers that they've not had a competent sporting department for 10 years to actually provide the leadership, guidance and that strength sometimes to be able to make sure that the recruitment is spot on and precise. And it's the hardest job in football getting recruitment precise. But if you get it wrong, 300, 400 million at a time, three, four times in 10 years, then that is just complete ultimate failure and that's down to the owners for not dealing with that and that's why Jim Ratcliffe's going to come in and all the reports say that he's going to take over the sporting department why do you think the Glazer family are going to allow someone to come in 
they're still the majority shareholders and let someone else take over the most important aspect of a football club, which is football, because they know they can't do it. So, yes, Eric Ten Hag should be doing better. Yesterday, obviously, you know, Martial playing up front was bizarre. Um, the, the style of play isn't there. The players need to do a lot better. Some of the performances individually and collectively are shambolic. That result yesterday is, to be fair, a disgrace. And can't believe it. Well done to Bournemouth, but it should not happen. And, however, the continued 10 years of failure is down to them. And I, I ultimately, just need, we just need to get to a point whereby the, there is a competent sporting structure put in place that gives Manchester United a chance to be able to at least operate on the same level with the other clubs that they're up against in this league who have got fantastic ways of doing things. Uh, and next Sunday is a... Look, if you sit here now and you're a United fan, you've got a feeling that you're going to get beat up and you're going to get done in properly because of 7-0 last year and the way in which they're playing at the moment, it doesn't always work out like that. And I'm sure Jurgen Klopp this week and the Liverpool players won't be sat there thinking, oh, here we go, this is easy pickings. That's not how it goes in football. The thing that Manchester United have to fear most is that Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp are a professional bunch and they've done well over a five, six, seven year period. And this Manchester United team, my concern is that they haven't got it in them to surprise us, that they haven't got the leadership, they haven't got the, the quality to be able to go to Anfield, and that is a bear pit of a place for a United player. I don't care what team you are, I don't care how good you are, whether you're a championship winning team from Man United, or whether you're a team that's basically sixth, seventh, eighth in the league, it can be a bear pit and it can swallow you up. And if those players don't stand up and stick that chest out next week, and they don't take the ball and show courage, it will eat you alive. And that's what they've got to prepare for this week, courage to play. But before that, they've got the very sort of minor and small task of Bayern Munich in the Champions League. So it's a tough week for them, but it shouldn't be a tough week. These should be the weeks that a Manchester United team should dream of. Bayern Munich, Liverpool away. But it's a, it's a, it's a week now that becomes fearful and makes you anxious. And that's just the state of the club in general. And it's financially in a mess. Even from an FFP, debtors point of view, debt point, everything it's a mess and it needs dealing with properly and that can only happen with change of ownership So for balance from a Liverpool perspective, do you think they come into the into the week licking their lips? I would get right any of you, Liverpool, you'd go right for Manchester United early in the game and, and sort of just get into their heads and if you get a goal in front you know they could capitulate, they've got it in them they've seen it before, last season they capitulate quite often, they concede three and four goals quite regularly it's not something that's rare. So what I'm saying to you is it, it, the evidence is there that if United, to be fair, go a goal down, Liverpool can think straight away, well, they're not going to handle that very well. So, yeah, I would be, I would be licking my lips if I was Liverpool. Um, and I, but I'd also be guarded and make sure that you're professional and do your job and don't take anything for granted and you're not complacent. If you're Manchester United, somehow someone in the club, it's going to be the manager, Eric Ten Hag, he's got to somehow this week find a way. And... I can't be conned by the Everton and the Chelsea wins because at Everton, to be fair, we were there, weren't we? And that sort of 20 minutes before half-time, they could have conceded two or three goals. Chelsea the other night were abysmal. I know we all stayed clear of probably saying how bad Chelsea were because you didn't want to take away from the United. You can't be seen to criticise them all the time. And there was a high energy in the game. But Chelsea were awful. Chelsea were woeful, woefully bad. And they got beat up again today at Goodison Park. So Chelsea and Manchester United at this moment in time are a bit of a laughing stock. Yeah, well, they're certainly the two big names that aren't amongst the big names at the very top. I think we more or less covered it. Gary, I don't know if you want to say a word about Sheffield United, who had a management change this week and, and got a win. Yeah. Um, I like Paul Heckingbottom. He was at the club at Manchester United with me, but, you know, a change was probably inevitable. We, I, I think, gone a long time without a manager being sacked this season as well. So it was a case of just getting to that point now whereby, obviously, they're under pressure. It's so tough for the teams that come up to actually exist in this league and uh, you know Chris Wilder's back in they get a win there's obviously something can happen sometimes with a change of man you can get a bounce uh, and we talk about a title race at the top what we do, what we hope at the bottom is that the three teams don't get sort of cut off adrift and we end up with a situation whereby that's dealt with quite early we want it to be competitive we need a competitive league between 1 to 20 and that anyone can beat each other and that, that was really good earlier on today Luton and Manchester City the fact that Luton went up and then Manchester City have to come back and fight that's how it should be for the top teams. That's how it was when we used to go to teams at the bottom of the league and it was tough and it was small pitch, it was physical, different style of play and you've got to grind out a result. And City have done that really well today.